Hey, very warm welcome everybody to our next edition of Transforming Performance Management. Today, I'm very excited that we will be talking about the future of performance management, total motivation through skill-based apprenticeship. And I'm very excited to be hosting a, a colleague who I've been working with in the past, Neil Doshi, who's joining us from New York. Neil is the co-founder of Vega Factor and the co-author of an international management bestseller, Prime to Perform. And um, I'm inviting everybody to have a look at the book. It's very exciting. Uh, Neil, together with his wife, Lindsay McGregor, are exploring how to create high-performance cultures in workplaces by tapping into um, psychological needs of employees, but also the, late, the latest and greatest in psychological research. Neil is a former partner in McKinsey. He has been founding a award-winning tech startup in his past. He's been having roles in technology and banking, and he brings a wealth of experience in HR across many different sectors and many different organizations. And um, um, a, a final word, maybe, if you want to understand more about uh, Neil and Viga Factor, I invite you all to visit vigafactor.com, where you will find more insights and tools on how to build technologies that can empower organizations. And with that, a very warm welcome, Neil, and thank you so much for making time for joining us. I got it. Uh, thank you, Adi. Really appreciate it. And it's great to have you here, and, and thanks, thanks so much. Two more words before I hand over to Neil. As always, a, um, a, a, a greeting, a salute also to all our colleagues and friends who are joining us in our mission to transform performance management. As I've said many times, this is a project that was started in November last year in Amsterdam. Uh, together with a group of people, we're trying to develop a performance management manifesto and new practices that can be applied throughout HR in trying to make performance management not only better in creating business performance, but truly generating uh, societal and um, in, in internal flourishing in organizations. And we're very excited to be at the HR Congress next week. And again, we're not directly co related to the HR Congress as all our work is pro bono, but that said, we're very happy to join with Mihai and the uh, Congress organization to be engaging in lots of exciting conversations with HR colleagues to figure out how together we can make the world of performance management and the world of HR a tiny little bit better. And uh, with that, without further ado, Neil, thanks again and over to you. What we want to talk about is what does performance management look like at the cutting edge these days? And as you can imagine, a ton is changing. The world is quite different. And my hope is to give you a very fast overview of what that looks like. We'll have a bunch of time at the end for questions. So feel free to share whatever question or thought or idea you might have. Uh, happy to talk it through with you guys. So to kick us off, I want to start with a story of an interesting performance management problem. The story took place about 10 years ago. The company we're gonna look at is Tesla. So Tesla, as you guys might understand, is a very interesting organization. Its market value is greater than almost the rest of the automobile industry, like done incredibly well in bringing in this electric vehicle future. But if you recall about 10 years ago or so, Tesla's share price already had baked in the belief that they would build a mass market car, which they hadn't yet. So there's a lot riding on this. So they decided to come up with a car called the Model 3. The Model 3, if you go back in time, in their first earnings call, Q1 of 2016, they told their investors that Model 3 production in 2017 is going to be 2,000 cars per week, 7,500 in 2018. So they're actually announcing this publicly. As you imagine, in earnings calls, this is a pretty big deal. A few months later, they buy the world's leader in building factory robots because their vision was a humanless factory. They imagined a machine that built the machine. You fast forward a little further, 2017 Q1 earnings call, they double down on their targets. They essentially say that they're going to build 5,000 cars per week in 2017, 10,000 in 2018. If you keep going, they buy another leader in factory automation. 
Now, my hope is at this point in this conversation, there's enough clues on how Tesla is thinking about performance that should ring some alarm bells. Because when you get to their next year's earning call, Tesla Model 3 production is now 2,000 cars per week, nowhere near the target of 10,000 vehicles per week. Mm -hmm. If you remember at this point in the news, this was a massive miss. Elon Musk was sleeping in the factories. The, they were putting tents in the parking lots to build more assembly lines because they viewed this rightfully as a near-death experience for them. How did they get performance so wrong here? Well, an analyst who covers Tesla was trying to research this and study how did they end up missing their performance targets for so much. Here's what that analyst writes. He writes, automation simply can't deal with the complexity, inconsistencies, variation, and things gone wrong that humans can. In final assembly, robots can apply torque consistently, but they don't detect and account for threads that aren't straight, bolts that don't quite fit, fasteners that don't align, or seals that have a defect. Humans are really good at this. Have you ever wondered why Teslas have wind noise problems, squeaks and rattles, and bits of trim that fall off? Now you have your answer. What this analyst was pointing out was a fundamental truth of performance that if we're going to build great performance management systems, we all have to understand. The truth is quite simple. There are two types of performance, not one. The first type of performance is called tactical performance. You can think about this as convergence. We have a process. We want everyone to follow it. It's about repeatability. It's about how well we stick to our plans. So for example, in this factory, their vision was it was all tactical performance. Hence, robots can do the job. Think about another example. Imagine you wanted to build a call center. Imagine you started a company who's doing outbound telesales. Well, what would you do to manage that tactical performance? You'd figure out what are the four or five customer segments. You'd write talking scripts for them. You'd estimate the lengths and conversion rates of those calls. You'd put all that into a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet would calculate how much people, how much cost, how much revenue, what their performance targets would be. You'd operationalize all that with policy process procedure, QA, QC, call listening, pay for performance. All of that is just managing tactical performance. As we talk about performance management today, this is problem number one I see in most companies. Their performance management system is only managing half the equation because the other type of performance is called adaptive performance. If tactical is about convergence, adaptive is about divergence. So for example, problem solving. If tactical is about repeatability, adaptive is about improvement. So creativity, innovation, experimentation. If tactical is how well we stick to the plan, adaptive is how well we don't stick to the plan. Tesla didn't understand this. They doubled down on tactical at the expense of adaptive. This is playing out in companies all over the place. They've built performance management systems that double down on tactical performance and actually destroy their adaptive performance because these two are definitional opposites. The more you drive one, the more you destroy the other. And so fundamentally, if you want to build great systems of performance management, you, those systems have to keep these two types of performance in balance at the highest levels. Now, Tesla eventually realized this, although I don't think fully, if I'm being honest. Elon Musk tweets out, yes, this excessive automation at Tesla was a mistake. To be precise, my mistake. Humans are underrated. Now, in our work, we spend most of our time helping companies implement performance management systems. And when we work with them, we think about it in a level that's one level deeper. So imagine, for example, an organization or team or you can have low tactical performance or high tactical performance, low adaptive performance or high adaptive performance. Now, imagine an organization that is high adaptive, low tactical. This is typically where companies start because if you're starting an organization, if it's not adaptive, you will not survive the first year or two. But at scale, high adaptive, low tactical, what it looks like is every team is like their own boat. The teams are arbitrarily different. They're pointing in different directions. Yes, they can adapt in their own context. They can actually point the boat where they want to go. But there's very little synergy and there's a lot of waste. Now, of course, this doesn't really work. And so a lot of organizations end up trying to pivot to high tactical, low adaptive. High tactical, low adaptive, it's like your organization is this giant cargo vessel. You can get a lot of momentum. There's a lot of weight and mass behind that, that organization. But if you try to pivot it, if you try to adjust course, it would take forever and a day. Now, what I often see is organizations are unhappy with this quadrant too. And the pattern I often see is every four years, massive reorgs. So one year, we're gonna decentralize everything. Well, why? Because we're not being innovative. 
We're not listening to our customers. We're not adapting to our local markets. So we decentralize. Next thing you know, they don't like that because they've lost their tactical performance. So they centralize everything four years later. Let's pull everything into the center. Let's make thin regions, thin districts. Let's actually put all of the decision-making in the center. Well, that doesn't work. It's too slow. It's not adaptive enough. Four years later, they reorg. The problem is that all of that often leaves people in the state that is low tactical and low adaptive. These are organizations that I would call reactive. They're fire drill organizations. Like if it isn't a fire drill, if there isn't a burning platform, they don't drive change. They don't actually move things forward. They tend to feel a lot uh, quite chaotic in how they operate. Now, of course, these three quadrants are not ideal. The goal is the upper right, high tactical, high adaptive. It feels like every person, every team is like their own ship. They're able to drive the ship, steer the ship, match the winds as they need to, match the currents as they need to, but they're all pointing in the same direction. They're all able to share parts. There's very little arbitrary uniqueness. Crew can jump from ship to ship and they can still operate it. Now, as we look at how organizations are evolving, the future of work, organizations on some level understand this. And so there's been a fairly massive desire for companies to try to get themselves to quadrant four, high tactical, high adaptive. The question is, is how do you do that from a performance management perspective? That's where it's critical to understand how performance management plays a role and how to scale that up. Now you're seeing today a lot of organizations getting this wrong. One that played out pretty recently and pretty publicly is happening at Google. So a former Google executive wrote quite publicly, Google has 175,000 capable, well-compensated engineers who get very, very little done quarter over quarter, year over year. Like mice, they're trapped in a maze of approvals, launch processes, legal reviews, performance reviews, exec reviews, documents, meetings, bug reports, triage, OKRs, H1 plans, H2 plans, all hand summits, inevitable reorgs. The mice are regularly fed their cheese, promotions, bonuses, fancier food, fancier perks. And despite many wanting to experience personal satisfaction and impact from their work, the system trains them to quell these inappropriate desires and learn what it means to be googly, just don't rock the boat. And as Deepak Mahotra put it in his excellent business fable, at some point the problem is no longer that the mouse is in the maze, the problem is that the maze is in the mouse. What you're seeing here is broken performance management. Hmm. Now, a lot of people think about performance management narrowly. It's just the means by which you get a rating. Performance management is an ecosystem of all of the mechanisms that we use to drive performance. And if we don't think about that as a full-on ecosystem, we're likely going to engineer it incorrectly. So one, this is the first question. If we're going to figure out how do we actually build excellent performance management systems, we do have to answer three questions. What is performance? What drives performance? What scales performance? What is performance? The answer, tactical and adaptive, not one or the other. You need a system that is able to drive both without them cannibalizing each other at high levels. Okay, that's question number one. What is performance? When we're trying to build high levels of performance, when we're trying to build great performance management systems, it has to be tactical and adaptive. One or the other will lead to a organization that is not just ineffective, but it's gonna constantly feel like it has to reorg or restructure its systems co continuously. So that's one. Question two is what drives performance? Now this one, we can really shortcut the answer to that because on some level, I think we all intuitively get this, that fundamentally motivation drives performance. The more we're motivated, the more we perform. But then shouldn't performance management be motivating? And when we look at a lot of organizations' systems of performance management, they are in fact actually demotivating. The very example you just saw with Google was performance management that was demotivating. So then what does it mean for a system to be motivating? To answer that, we have to unpack motivation. And to unpack motivation, I have to share with you a framework called the motive spectrum. Motives, the root of the word motivation, the word motive means why are you, do, why are you doing something? What's your reason for a behavior? It is the root of, of motivation. Now, it turns out when you unpack human motives, there are only six of them. So for example, a person's motive can come from one of three places. There's the activity or the work itself. There is their, uh, their own identity, what they value, what they believe in. And then there's everything else, everything separate from the work, separate from your identity. We're gonna take these three ingredients and give you all of the human motives. The first motive is called play. The circle here symbolically represents the motive itself. It's aligned with the work itself because play is when you do an activity simply because you enjoy doing that activity. 
You like it because it's fun. It piques your interest. So for example, think about a hobby that you do outside of work. Why are you doing that hobby? You're probably not getting paid for it. In fact, you're probably actually spending a lot of money on it. You might not even be good at it. So why are you doing it? We humans put a lot of energy into play. At work, play often looks, feels like those moments where you're trying something new, experimenting, solving a problem. Novelty and play are actually quite tightly intertwined with each other. The second motive is called purpose. This, this, so this symbol that represents the motive is now a little further to the right. It straddles the line between your identity and the work itself. Now, it's important to understand what purpose is and what it isn't, because I find that a lot of practitioners are getting this wrong. By the way, they're getting play wrong too. Like the number of companies I see that think play is ping pong tables or kombucha, that's not what it is. It has to come from the work itself. That is a critical distinction. Purpose. Purpose is when you do an activity because you value your outcome. You value the impact you're having. Now, a lot of organizations get this wrong too. They think purpose will come from the big mission statement. It actually doesn't, not for large companies. To better understand purpose, it's important to understand its opposite. The best opposite I've ever found for the purpose motive is when you feel fungible, easily replaceable. You feel like a cog in the machine. If you feel easily replaceable, like if you don't go to work today, no big deal. Like think about those call centers where you're jacked into the call lines. When a, when a customer calls in, it, you hear a beep in your ear, customer starts talking. If you log out of the system, no big deal. All those calls get automatically rerouted. You are a fungible cog in the machine. While it's easy to feel like the work matters, you don't feel like your work matters. That's the purpose motive. It's the opposite of fungibility. You don't feel like a cog in the machine. You feel like your work, your contribution matters. Critical distinction, because a lot of people are investing millions of dollars in writing mission statements. That's not it. That's not what creates the purpose motive. Now, the next motive is the potential motive. Circle is a little further to the right, because the potential motive is now you believe that the work is leading to something eventually that will matter to you. Now, this is where a big mission might come in. This is where your own career growth might come in. This is where personal growth and personal skill development might come in. But these are all eventual outcomes. They're not immediate. Immediate would be the purpose motive. These three motives are called the direct motives because in some way they are directly related to the work itself. Play is the work. Purpose, immediate outcomes, potential, eventual outcomes. But there are motives that are not directly related to the work itself. So for example, I want you to ask yourself a question. Have you ever tried to get a loved one to do something by using guilt? Has anyone here ever guilted a loved one to doing something? Tim's like, yep, I, I definitely have. Um, so guilt is an example of the first of the indirect motives called emotional pressure. The symbol now straddles the line between external force and your identity. So for example, let's say I were to guilt my wife into um, doing an errand for our children. Well, my, the activity is the errand. My wife's identity is she values her husband, she values her children. I am the external force. External force acting in your identity to get you to do something is definitionally emotional pressure. So for example, peer pressure, like your children are going to do some uh, high risk behavior. Well, why? Well, the activity is a high risk behavior. Your child's identity is they care about what their peers think about them. Their peers are the external force. All of these are examples of emotional pressure. At work, emotional pressure commonly manifests as this feeling or need to look good to others. Like I'm in a meeting with my boss or my boss's boss and I've got to look good in that meeting. I'm not solving for the work now, I'm solving for looking good to someone else, hence emotional pressure. The next motive is called economic pressure. Economic pressure I think is the trickiest one to understand because economic pressure is not money. It's not pay even. Economic pressure is when you feel essentially coerced by reward or punishment. It's the stick and the carrot that's making you do something. Your motive is essentially to get the carrot or avoid the stick. That is economic pressure. And the last motive, probably my favorite, symbol is now off the page, it's called inertia. It's when you ask somebody, why are you doing what you're doing? And they say, I have no idea. I, they can't even tell you the source of their motivation. They're just going through the motions at this point. Now, when you, when you really look at these motives, 
what you'll see is these motives on the left, the ones that are teal here, are about self-control, agency, choice. People that manifest these really often come across as quite intense. The motives on the right, coercion, control, manipulation. When you start to map this to performance, here's where things get really interesting. If you want to create tactical performance, any motive to, can create it. I can create a game that you'll find fun and you'll follow the rules and follow the processes. I can use economic pressure, reward. I can use emotional pressure, guilt, to get you to converge, follow a plan, follow your instructions, follow your orders. It's actually not, it's not hard to create motivation for tactical performance. However, if you want adaptive performance, the direct motives increase it and the indirect motives decrease it. So fundamentally, performance management has to increase your direct motives and decrease your indirect ones. Most performance management systems do the exact opposite. The exact opposite. Now, this might seem radical to many of you. Like, you know, I've, I've shared this with now hundreds of thousands of people. And I find at this point, there's a very common, common thing that people go through. This interesting tension between this seems intuitive and obvious, and yet at the same time not, because we don't seem to practice this. Well, I really wanna make sure that the intuition is super clear. So for example, imagine these motives would apply to not just work. Imagine they they apply to any behavior that you actually have. Every action you have, every behavior is driven by motives. So let's do a simple one. I want you to think about a relationship that you're in. It could be spouse, significant other. Think about a relationship you're in and ask yourself, why are you in that relationship? What's your motive? And please don't put that in the Zoom chat. Nobody wants to know. But what is your motive for being in that relationship? Now, you could say play purpose potential. Play, I have fun with this other person. Purpose, we're creating something important together. Potential, we'll eventually create something important together. Or you could say emotional pressure. I'd feel, I'd feel guilt if I were to leave. Uh, economic pressure. Have you seen the rent in London? I need my wife's income just to stay in this house. Or inertia. I have no idea why I'm with this person. Now imagine two people answering that question. Every relationship needs adaptive performance. There's problems to solve, issues, the plan didn't work out. And in those moments, you have to be adaptive. Problem solve, compromise, experiment, listen to each other. Which of these two people is more likely to be adaptive when that situation calls for it? I hope you're seeing all I'm giving you is logic. This is a logical lens to see the world through. And once you start to see the world through this lens, you will see the pattern. Now, of course, when studied, you find this playing out, that the direct motives increase a couple's problem-solving behaviors, the indirect motives decrease it. Of course it does. Direct motives, as a result, lead to more marital happiness, indirect motives to less. Of course it does. You can see this in any form of human behavior that requires adaptability. So for example, you want your kids to learn in school. Direct motives increase it, indirect motives decrease it. Essentially, guilting your kids to get to learn in school doesn't work. Helping them find a love of learning does. You want, you're coaching a team. You want them to perform well on, on the field. Direct motives increase that grit. Indirect motives decrease it. Again, all I'm trying to do is give you a logical frame to see the world that we don't often look through. And so we can simplify this one level further to something called total motivation. The reason why it's called total motivation is very simple. If you really want to maximize performance, you can't just look at one of these motives. You have to look at all of them. And a high total motivation team or organization, or high TOMO for short, the weight of these motives in people's minds is heavily tilted towards the direct motives. So people are driving, doing their work because of play, purpose, potential, not emotional pressure, economic pressure, and inertia. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations are low total motivation or low TOMO, where it's the other way around. Lots of emotional pressure, economic pressure, inertia, very little play purpose potential. The irony is performance management systems, the, the majority of the ones that we've encountered are actually lowering total motivation, not increasing it. Why? Because they don't see adaptive performance. They don't realize how important it is. So think about the, as a simple example, think about the general electric stack rank once lauded as like one of the most amazing things to do in management. Well, of course, this is a seriously low total motivation system that's left GE today as far from what should have been GE. It's essentially being broken apart, sold for its parts. 
Now, when we measure motivation in companies, you see this very interesting pattern. So let's take, for example, the airline industry where the vertical axis here is customer satisfaction, horizontal is employee motivation. Now, customer satisfaction requires tactical and adaptive performance. As a customer, you want your airlines to follow processes and procedures, but you also want them to solve problems. Like you don't want them to be so oriented to their rules that they're not using common sense to solve problems anymore. And so you should expect to see a relationship and you do. When you look at airlines against employee motivation versus customer satisfaction, you see a couple of things. Even though the industry is highly commoditized, highly regulated, it's economically a difficult industry. And for whatever reason, boarding a plane brings out the worst in humanity. And yet still, you see these airlines create meaningful separation and motivation, which is correlating tightly to customer satisfaction. Do another example. These are brick and mortar grocery chains, another low margin industry, not really easy to operate in. And you see again, meaningful separation and motivation correlating extremely tightly to customer satisfaction. Now we've implemented these systems in companies. In fact, we do it every single day. And you see this play out in any outcome that requires tactical and adaptive performance. So for example, in one organization, we ran a controlled experiment against their frontline stores. And what they found was their control, which essentially used low tomo performance management systems, year over year on productivity, 9% lift, our pilot, only high tomo control um, performance management systems. In fact, we got rid of commissions in this model. 20% lift in productivity. On net promoter score, the control lost 4%, our pilot gained 11. On cross sales, the control 2% lift, the pilot 8% lift. This was a massive windfall. In fact, this institution told us this was the single most successful frontline pilot they've ever done. And all we did was replace the performance management system with one that lowers TOMO with, to one that increases TOMO. So the second question was, what drives performance? And the answer was total motivation, not just one part of motivation. And that total motivation implies we're maximizing play purpose potential, we're minimizing emotional pressure, economic pressure, and inertia. So now we get to the, the last question of this conversation, the most technical one. Well, what do we, how do we scale that? And now you're starting to get into the ecosystem of performance management. What does that need to look like? So on this one, I'm gonna get pretty technical. I guess I have been getting pretty technical all along, but I think now it's gonna be even more so. Because when you look at these systems of driving performance, it's important to understand the goal is not compliance, the goal is growth. We're trying to improve. We're trying to improve in every dimension. And as you think about what is growth, you start to realize something very simple. Learning is the only sustainable way to improve performance. There's no other way. Let's say you want to enter a new market. You've got to learn. You want to launch a new product. You've got to learn. You want to try a new strategy in marketing. You've got to learn. You want to adopt AI. You've got to learn. The only sustainable way to improve performance is learning. This is why your performance management system fundamentally has to be high total motivation, not low. Because low total motivation systems actually, they reduce the pace of learning, not increase it. And so what does that look like? Let's get, let's get into the, the, the weeds on it for a moment. As you recall, we started with performance management as best has to be high tactical and high adaptive. It's gotta be the upper right. And for performance management to be high tactical, high adaptive in that upper right, we have to manage a, a, few, a few factors below it. So to think about driving learning in this upper right, the categories we have to actually drive it against are the why, the what, and the how of work. The why, we just talked about it, motivation. Why we work determines how well we work. And your motives are why you work. The what. When you think about what the what, for most organizations, they think about this in goals. For tactical performance, that makes sense. And to really put a fine point on it, why do we need goals? We need goals because you have to sometimes work backward from your future state and solve for global optima. Global optima oftentimes requires teams to get worse before they get better. And very few teams on their own will go through a journey of worse before it become, becomes better. You really do need tactical performance to solve for these dips in performance that get people from a local optima to a global optima. But you also have on the other side of adaptive performance experimentation. 
Experimentation is working forward from your current state, solving for local optima. It's going up Pareto curves. And so when we're trying to drive performance holistically, and we're trying to manage the what of performance, we got to manage both experimentation and goals, the tactical and the adaptive. And then lastly, the how, how we do our work. Well, to make this simple, imagine you were a chef in a Michelin starred restaurant. Well, these restaurants have process. They have recipes, they have stations, they have like specific ways of going through everything. And then you ask yourself, if you have such tight process, why do I need master chefs in the kitchen? Can't Neil Doshi do it? Like I can't cook to save my life, but like, surely I can follow a recipe. Well, that's tactical performance. If the recipe and the process perfectly match every input, every ingredient, the weather, the issue, any issues with the machine, yeah, your recipe will work. But the problem is those inputs are highly variable. The ingredients differ a little bit from time to time. The weather changes from time to time that affects cooking. And so master chefs actually also need skill. That's why when you watch Gordon Ramsay and he's teaching a chef, he says you have to continually taste your own cooking. Why? Because the process is an abstraction. It'll be right on the average. It's the continuous feedback of tasting your own cooking and then applying your own skill to that that takes something from average to world-class. And so fundamentally, your system of performance has to manage the how, the what, the why, motivation, goals, experimentation, process, and skill. Now, to get all of that right in a team, you wrap that around prioritization and problem solving. So this is from this is the system of fully managing performance. You got to get all these pieces right. And how do you do that systematically? You build it into rhythms. So for example, what we find to be pretty optimal for most organizations are annual, quarterly, and weekly rhythms. Annual, vision and strategy alignment, skill-based compensation. Quarterly, skill checks, goal checks, health checks. Weekly, prioritization and problem solving. This is it. Like when, you, when you're looking for the cutting edge of performance management, how does it work? It's getting these pieces in place in a systematic rhythm. You get there, you get to the cutting edge of performance management. Now, what I wanna do in the time we have left is I wanna double click on a few of these pieces. I wanna double click on the quarterlies and skill-based compensation. Because generally, the problem that we find in most organizations is at this point, they'll say, Neil, I'm with you. Like it makes tons of sense. The problem that we have is, is on skill. Like we have skill gaps, top to bottom. And so we can't even get the quarterlies or the weeklies to work right. How do we actually create, how do we actually drive the kind of system you're asking for if we have that? That's what I want to unpack now because the cutting edge of this has actually started to solve for that. So let's start with the goal check. Now, I want you to think about goals in your organization and ask yourself, how do they work? Now, imagine three options. You have no goal, like you essentially tell teams, do your best. This is more like, let's just kind of do whatever you want to do. You've got performance goals. So performance goal would be something like increase market share from 7% to 21%. And you have learning goals. So a learning goal would be something like identify and test six different ideas to improve market share to 21%. Now, I want you to really look at the subtle difference here, especially between performance and learning goal. They're both trying to shoot for the 21%, but the learning goal is specifically not about the 21, it's about the six different ideas. The goal was actually the velocity of learning. It wasn't the actual target. Now, ask yourself at this point in this conversation, which do you think will lead to the highest levels of performance? Now, my suspicion is most of you will probably say, given all we just went through, probably C. Then ask yourself, well, what is your organization most likely to use? Most, most leaders in most organizations will say either one or two here. What, what two in organizations often feels like is the coach that just says, team from now on, we're using OKRs. I'll tell you how many points to get, you figure out the rest. This isn't coaching, this isn't leadership. And so what you see in practice is between no goal, performance goal, learning goal, learning behaviors. So how much of these, how much are colleagues actually looking for more information? Learning goals, create more learning behaviors. 
when it comes to confidence. Think about confidence as an important input to motivation. You have to feel less confident with the other two, significantly more with learning goal. So motivation is starting to increase. And in terms of performance, learning goals significantly higher performing. What ends up happening in organizations is most end up using performance goals. But performance goals, most people don't realize that as leaders, they have to turn those into learning goals to drive performance. If they don't do it, what generally happens is teams just try to work harder. They try to, they think like harder work is going to solve the problem, but it doesn't. So what you see is generally, oops, leaders struggle with breaking down their goals, especially during learning goals. So how do we get goal, goal setting right at scale? The answer is each team should do a quarterly goal check. So let me give you some, let me give an example that actually played out with an organization that, that does this. So Anna is a senior HR executive. She was told to fill 60 job openings by the end of the quarter. Now, quarterly, generally, she was targeting closer to 30. So she couldn't, she didn't, she wasn't on track to getting 60, but the company was growing, so she had to grow with it. Now, most, most people who are especially new to leadership, they would look at a goal like this and think they're just being asked to work harder. But there wasn't really much more juice left in the tank. The goal is to actually work smarter. But that's not what we're managing. We're not managing the learning. So what Anna does is she uses a tool called factor.ai to build her learning goals. And what that looks like, she tells her learning goals that I'm trying to go from, she, try, she tells factor.ai I'm trying to go to 60, and it starts to help her break that down. So this is actually the real output. How might we enhance our recruiting marketing? Comes up with ideas, launch a referral program with incentives for current employees, partner with professional associations, universities, increase social media presence with targeted ads. It has other problems. How might we streamline the hiring process? Uh, how might we improve candidate experience? How might we leverage technology more effectively? So for example, use video interviewing tools to speed up the process. How might we expand our talent pool? Essentially, because she was struggling to know how to do this, the AI goal check actually helps her break it down into problems and gets her started, gets her team started, actually fills them with curiosity. What we've observed when teams do this, it increases their play because it's actually exposing them to many more ideas and getting them to think differently about their work. So target number one is quarterly, quarterly factory AI goal checks, simple way to create great learning goals, align teams, reduce burnout. Let's talk about motivation, the health check. The problem here is simple. Motivation is a critical input to performance it's the thing that most organizations struggle to really accept is it's driven mostly by day-to-day -day experiences. Organizations behave like motivation is centralized, that like the CEO of a 10,000 person company somehow controls this. They don't. In reality, if you think about play, play is fundamentally local. It's in your work. It's in your team. If you think about purpose, purpose is fundamentally local. It's in your work. It's in your team. Potential emotional pressure, economic pressure, inertia, 50-50, local, global. That alone, though, puts the majority of impact on a person's motivation local to within their teams. But most teams don't know how to manage motivation. Most leaders are actually often afraid to do it. And so how do we solve for that gap? Quarterly, part of the quarterly performance management cadence is every team does a quarterly health check. Quarterly health check also powered by factor AI makes it very easy for teams to become high tone with themselves. So I'll give you a real example. This example came from a company that um, is smaller, mid-sized company. This is their finance team doing their health check. So the finance team did their health check. This company is also in the period of like hyperscaling. So they're growing very quickly. And what the AI told them was starting with the positives. Play. Play is about enjoying the work itself, likely because you're feeling curious, experimenting, learning something new. In a finance team, play might be when a team member is problem solving, experimenting on new ways to streamline financial operations, implement new systems. And their colleague, uh, Jose, wrote, some parts that are motivating for me is getting new processes and for expenses. Um, Lindsay wrote, the parts that are motivating for me are the new processes and procedures. So the health check starts with reminding the team. They already feel play, purpose, and potential in their work. The health check gives them a read on motivation. So in this case, they were finding that their total motivation between health checks was dropping a little bit. It was actually dropping because play was dropping a little bit. And so they had a very tight understanding of that. The health check also gives teams 
hypotheses on what's likely driving that. So for example, the health check writes, do any of these hypotheses resonate? I have a five minute discussion, lack of variety in tasks. The team might be feeling like the work is becoming redundant and cyclical at times, which could be reducing the sense of play. Uh, and one of their colleagues wrote, not because it's not motivating, but the payroll function is very important, but it can be redundant in cyclical times, or John writes, it's least motivating to be boring to do the same thing every month. So now they have an incredibly accurate diagnosis of the thing most in the way of their motivation. So then the team starts to ideate, again, with the help of AI, and they came up with a bunch of ideas. These are real ideas that this team came up with. So one was asynchronously ideate on what problems the team would like to solve in the next few quarters, work together to prioritize them, identify a problem and have open dialogue from uh, team brainstorming. So they realized they had to create play on their team. And so they created their own ideas on sol solving new problems, in including the team, getting everyone involved. That's essentially a quarterly health check. Very simple and powerful way to drive performance. It's super critical because essentially without motivation, the rest of the performance system doesn't really work. Like trying to solve for motivation through your annual processes doesn't really work. Lastly, skills. Skills, I, I'd argue, is the hardest of the three. It's hard because it has a lot of emotion wrapped up in it. It has a lot of low tomo emotion wrapped up into it. But it's critical to understand it's incredibly powerful. So for example, we've measured motivation levels now in like tens of thousands of companies. And imagine you had two, two different aspects of your job. I don't learn valuable skills in the job, or I do. I have poor work-life balance or I have good work-life balance. Now, what I find is a lot of leaders will say, you know, Neil, I went from poor work-life balance to my team to really good work-life balance. Like I really manage that now. I really take care of that now. Now, yes, was there an increase in motivation? Sure, but these leaders will still say, but my team doesn't seem that motivated. Like I've solved for this axis, but I'm just not seeing the, the real lift in motivation. Our data would say, yeah, you get some, just not much. If you really wanna augment that, when you start to solve for the vertical axis here, I learned valuable skills, motivation levels start to really skyrocket. And the both together, of course, you get to a really much higher level of motivation. So from our perspective, we see skill development, not just as valuable for things like closing skill gaps. Skill gaps are widespread, by the way. Percent of employees who have not mastered the skills they need for their job, 70%. Percent of employees who feel like they're easily replaceable, so essentially fungible cogs in the machine, 52%. Percent of employees who experience or soon expect experience skill gaps, 87%. To us, skill-based apprenticeship is not just to solve skill gaps. It's actually a performance lever. You do it, you get motivation. That motivation spills over onto all of the work that that person's doing. Now, it's important to understand when we're talking about skills, we're not talking about what a lot of organizations have as legacy feedback models. The problem with legacy feedback models, think about how they work. These legacy feedback models are about unsolicited negative feedback on behaviors offering training with no approach to validate learning. That's typically what the legacy feedback models look like. Apprenticeship is exactly the opposite on all of these dimensions. It's solicited ideas on, to improve skills, offering on the job practice with endorsements to validate learning. Apprenticeship is nowhere near the legacy feedback models. The biggest shift is unsolicited to solicited people wanting to learn on the job. The second biggest shift is feedback, negative to ideas, behaviors to skills, training to on-the-job practice. The fundamental goal here is to create an apprenticeship culture. Now that's really hard. Leaders are often scared of doing it, uh, or they don't have the time. Like it takes a lot of time to think about each colleague, what they should do. Leaders are afraid they're gonna trigger their colleagues and end up with a, bla a bad glass door review. And so there's a lot of fear and time management issues in the way of building apprenticeship cultures. And so again, we realize that there's a gap there. The gap is easily solved by AI. So factor AI skill checks are an AI powered discussion between a colleague and their leader to create an apprenticeship plan for the quarter. Here's how it works. They navigate colleagues through three questions. One is a potential question. What direction do you wanna take your career? The second is a purpose question. What are your most important goals for the qu next quarter? What essentially what impact you wanna have in the quarter? There's a play question. What skills would be most fun to learn? Based on these three questions, factor.ai helps you actually choose skills to learn. 
So for example, the AI will go through the library of about 150 skills and say, here's one, managing projects for a group. So given your goal to double the recruiting output for your HR team, mastering the skill of managing projects for a group will be crucial. Uh, it'll enable you to effectively lead your team through the increased workload, blah, blah, blah. Planning behavioral change. As you aim to significantly increase your team's recruiting output, understanding and implementing planning behavioral change is essential. So again, we can take these very difficult performance management concepts, put them on rails, and actually make them fun. Make them things that people and their leaders will want to do, not chores that they have to do for their boss's boss. Now, of course, to do this well, you need a good skill library. Um, in this approach, we use a skill library that has a bunch of skill sets, like organizing people in team, communications, problem solving and strategy, analysis, engineering, creativity and artistry, engaging customers, quality and risk, leadership. Each of these are broken into smaller skill sets. Um, for a total of, like our current library has a total of about 150 skills. So for example, teaching and persuading, you double click on that, you get to skills like communicating with structure or building alignment through first principles, logical arguments, or communicating with emotional rhetoric, or even just demoing your product or service. What's critical in getting a skill-based performance model right is these skills are not written for an evaluator. Like a lot of organizations get this wrong. They essentially write the skills in the direction of evaluation. That makes very little sense. You've essentially taken something that could have been high tomo, you're making it low tomo. Each of our skills are written from the direction of the learner and they're written to try to create curiosity. So for example, here's the definition for storytelling. One of the best frameworks of persuasion can be found in a book written 2,400 years ago, Aristotle's Rhetoric. In it, Aristotle defines three primary ways a speaker persuades an audience, logos, pathos, ethos. Storytelling is one of the most powerful forms of pathos. So the goal of a good skill model is actually to create play, curiosity, learning. You know, if you guys are as old as I am, when you went to college, you got a physical book that was the course catalog. Like I still remember, I still remember the summer before college, I got that physical book, I was reading it, I, was, I remember, I distinctly remember sitting on my parents' couch, the sun is coming through the window on this hot summer day, and I'm reading this course catalog and I'm so excited. I wanna take every single course this college has to offer, but I have to make choices. That's how this should feel. I wanna take every single, I wanna learn every single skill this organization has to offer, but I can't, I've gotta make choices. That making choices is what's making this high tomo. And once folks learn their skills, they can get endorsed on them. So for example, Carlos got endorsed on communicating with structure and a very technical engineering skill, functional programming. Now we get to the last piece, skill-based compensation. You can't really talk about performance management without talking about compensation on some level because a lot of companies I find are quite stuck on ratings. But why are they stuck on ratings? Because at the end of the day, they know that ratings is not effective motivating. But then how can they create meritocratic and accurate compensation? So one of the things I've seen a lot of companies that have kind of so-called gotten rid of ratings, they end up replacing them with shadow ratings. Like, because they have to drive compensation somehow. So you took something that was transparent, inclusive, and open. Because it was low tomo, you got rid of the transparency. That's actually worse. Now the question is, how can you actually create meritocratic and accurate compensation without ratings? Oh, by the way, I could ask the question about without titles and promotions either. Well, the answer is quite simple, skill-based compensation. Skill-based compensation is conceptually very simple. The way it works is all these skills that I just showed you, each has a dollar value associated with them. And so a person's compensation is the compensation is the sum of that value. That's really it. Every skill, 155 of them in our library has a dollar value associated to it. Compensation is the function of your total skill value. Now, to make it one level a little bit more complicated, the formula is actually the sum of all the value of your skills times the value of the skill level times a dollar per skill point. Essentially, we convert it to currencies, which can be used to determine cost of living adjustments or, or bell curve issues. Now, levels in skill-based systems should not be grades. Grades would make them low tomo again. Levels are about levels of impact. So for example, fluency is performing the skill consistently and with minimal task level supervision in one role. Mastery is fluency except multiple roles. It's about transferability. 
Amplifying is mastery, but you're also now the bar raiser for the organization. Multiplying is you're actually now externalizing. You're someone that the world looks at as an expert. Talent comes to your organization because of it. Capital comes to your organization because of it. And then of course, game changing is you're inventing in the skill, like you're way beyond the, the practice. When you think of skill-based compensation like this, it elegantly works for both experts and generalists. So for example, a generalist might have 15 skills of fluency, three at mastery, one at amplifying, produces a comp of 180. An expert might actually have only two skills of fluency, but one skill at multiplying, one skill at game changing, comp at 180. So the model is completely agnostic of generalist experts. It allows people to be who they want to be. Like whatever they want to actually drive in terms of their own development, they can. The other thing about a skill-based model, it reduces bias considerably. So for example, this is one organization that implemented skill-based compensation. The horizontal axis is the comp predicted by skills. The vertical is actual. And what you see here is generally, based on the model's prediction, people that are above the line were almost always male. So you're seeing a gender-based pay, pay by, uh, bias here. And what you're also finding is that you see this other issue where tenure was causing a disproportional increase in comp, which is typically the other bias. Now, what you also see here is how tightly skill-based comp does match actual compensation. And so what we found is that skill-based comp is the highest TOMO, most accurate, least biased form of compensation we've ever seen. Now, that was an incredibly fast march through the cutting edge of performance management. I want to leave the world open for a lot of questions in this conversation, but just to kind of recap this really fast Vulcan mind meld, we started with what is performance, tactical and adaptive. Any system that doesn't balance the two isn't going to be effective. The only way to balance the two is your system has to increase play purpose potential, not emotional pressure, economic pressure, and inertia. To do that, you've got to manage all five factors across your cadences, motivation, goals, experimentation, process, skills. We double clicked on a few of these. We didn't double click on all of them. Um, and for each of these, we could have spent another three hours just going into the weeds of it. But the point of all of this is that the cutting edge of performance management today is, is actually pretty turnkey. Like any organization can get to the cutting edge pretty quickly start to operationalize all of this, see performance gains fast, and more importantly, create cultures where people thrive, like people are motivated the right way. They do what humans do best, adapt. They collaborate in ways that humans do best. This has been our vision, our, our mission all along. And it's really amazing to see that we're really close to that ideal. I mean, thanks I'll very much, Neil. That's, I mean, brilliant um, presentation Neil, every single time when you when you talk what i'm taking away is this performance management i mean apart from the word which is wrong but it, it should be fun it should create joy it should bring that kind of almost like the, the the potential of what we can do together who we can become and be together back into the organization and it doesn't right at this, at this point i want to which i should have done at the beginning introduce Antoinette, my a good friend and colleague, as usual, Antoinette, Professor of Management and HR at the University of St. Gallen. And Antoinette is going to come, as I promised Neil, with the uh, difficult questions now to um, compare some of uh, Neil's data with her data, but also to pick up all the questions that we might have. So, um, Antoinette, welcome and over to you for the Q&A. Yeah, and I, I pick up the question you have already asked, because I think this is one of the main questions. So. You have this beautiful data, you have this very convincing talk. Um, in fact, also by now there is mounting evidence um, that, as you call it, economic and social pressure is rather detrimental for performance. Why are not more companies courageous enough to change their performance management system? Yeah, it's such a good question. And it's not, I wish there was a single answer. It's kind of an ecosystem of answers. But here's what I've generally seen. One, most leaders that are in this kind of this cohort of management, their apprentice their apprenticeships, like whether it was business school, whether it was like big consultancy, whether it was large company, their apprenticeship was heavily focused on tactical performance. I think about mine, like 10 years at a global consultancy, Warden, um, two startups, two big companies. In 
that my apprenticeship never really said, Neil, you double down the systems of tactical performance, you're probably going to decrease motivation and destroy adaptive performance. That never comes up. What does come up is here's how you create tactical performance. Here's the spreadsheet. Here are the calculations. Here's paper performance. Here's, here's that system. So one, the apprenticeship that many leaders have gone through has been incomplete. So what we find is we have to kind of complete that apprenticeship, help them see the whole picture. The second reason is I find that historically, the thread between performance management, motivation, and performance was not very tight. Hmm. Like it was, hey, it was this very vague, treat people better and performance will happen. And that vagary wasn't enough for businesses to say, I'm willing to put a business case around that. And so one of our goals was to actually get rid of that vagary. So for example, I remember talking to another big financial institution and I went through a longer version of this talk. So this talk was like a, a, an hour long. I went through about a three hour version with their C-suite. And at the end of it, I said to them, I'm gonna ask you a question right now, I want to give you an honest answer. Have you funded another business case in the last three years that was as tightly explanatory of causation as mm -hmm. what I just shared with you? And the answer was no, like they're marketing, they're branding, they're putting millions of dollars in it. There's very little actual science behind the causation of that branding campaign and their revenue. And so I actually had to point out to them, mm -hmm. the business case here is actually more solid than the business cases you already fund. So that's the second reason that like, you have to still make a business case, but, but we have. It's just that not many people have seen it. Um, the third reason is for a long time, the leaders have been struggling with the issue that I raised earlier. They just, they've always felt like they haven't had the skills amongst their lower level leaders, including middle management and frontline. And so let's say you don't feel like you have the skills of middle management frontline, you attempt to try to control them centrally. Mm. And so you create like, these much more rigid centralized control systems, high tactical performance, you're like that tanker. I, I commiserate with that. Like companies haven't apprenticed these skills very well. And if you think about the, these core skills like collaborative problem solving, I think about my own education, there was no part of it that taught me those skills. And so we have these gaps in terms of adaptive skills in the workplace. What we've realized is in order to get to this ideal world, we have to actually um, augment leaders with AI. Like that was the solution. Once we started to do that, the whole thing became a lot easier. Like mm -hmm. leaders stopped worrying about those skill gaps and they said, okay, we can be the boats on the upper right. Um, but there's a few other thoughts, Anthony, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna like consume the conversation with that question. But that's a, such a good question. Like why haven't we gotten there yet? The more we understand that question, the more we can drive change. And I love your answer because we have talked to a number of HR people now, and they tend to go to say, let's unbundle, and you do the opposite. You do bundle in a in a more coherent, more complementary fashion. I think that is um, certainly something, and that's why you can also build this causality case. And by um, giving leaders the skills, in the end, you, you also create trust. So I find that all um, very um, interesting and highly inspiring. Um, but still, I, I just want to maybe drill down on one more and then we have a number of questions I'm taking up. Um, but I believe some things in the old um, system are really, in my opinion, the drivers of this negative performance and are really highly problematic. And you, you picked on that as well. I think in the end, it's our need or we, we believe our alleged need to have high powered incentives to have pay for performance. So if you don't take that away, then it's very difficult to take appraisal away and so on and so forth. And, and again, uh, I want to um, give you, you this back because I feel that is also a little bit like a worldview um, um, point as well. Um, if we come from maybe more a neoliberal mindset, then we believe competition is good, pay for performance is good, we need that type of pay system. So how do you go uh, about this? Or do you never encounter something like that? Resistance? Um, no, we do. We definitely do. It's important to kind of tease apart different pay systems. Like, I'm simplifying the world quite a bit just for the sake of this question. But if you imagine three different pay system archetypes, skill-based compensation, which is what we just talked about, 
ratings based compensation and let's just say pure pay for performance like commissions ratings is not hard to get organizations passed because most understand that they don't really go very well mm -hmm. they just don't know what the alternative is mm -hmm. and like I, I was talking to the ceo of this amazing startup like he grew it from zero to 10 billion dollar valuation he said to me neil we just did our rating cycle we had to give a couple of great engineers kind of the not top rating and then they quit yeah and so this system that we have caused engineers i don't want to quit to quit and so it's not hard to get people past ratings because they understand the intuition there is much deeper it's commissions that's the trickier one and mm -hmm. the thing about commissions is that commissions can actually be a higher low tomo so let me give you an example i was working with a big bank once i actually measured the motivation level of all of their colleagues every single one from the ceo down to like everyone on the front line. And the job with the highest level of motivation was the small business banker. Small business banker was a 100% commission job. They have a book of business. And so why would that be the highest tomo? Because when you ask the small business banker, what does that commission mean? They don't see it as the company is paying them pay for performance. They see it as their, their customers are paying them and they're paying the company, mm -hmm. not the customers paying the company, the company's paying them. Now that's so subtle, but it's so critical because it's coming from the direction of the customer. It actually feels like a thank you. Mm -hmm. It feels like a symbol of the value they've created. When it comes from the company, it feels like manipulation. So for example, some of the, the leading ride sharing companies, like take Grab or Uber, they are really trying to make sure that drivers feel like the customer pays the driver, the driver pays Uber, not the customer pays Uber, Uber pays the driver. So anyway, all I have to say, commissions is very complicated from a motivation perspective. But what I do say to organizations is, if you need collaboration and risk taking, like if you need that kind of adaptive performance, you're not gonna get it in that kind of scheme. So that's interesting. And I mean, we did a field study with a sales service and we could also show that their motivation went up when we even also took commission away. So we also fully went to a salary system in that sense. Uh, but I can see it. It's almost more you're an entrepreneur in the market and that's a different signal. But I don't want to occupy the discussion because there are a number of questions now coming in and they're all uh, very much going to this fascinating uh, skill building what you're doing. And I would like to start with the one question by Wolfgang who is asking, would there be one skill to start building that might work as a Trojan skill triggering more of the skills needed to perform well to follow <laughs> complicated <skills> question <laughs> so, so um, let me try to play back the question essentially like if you were going to start a colleague on a path of skill development is there like a place to start yeah you know i'll, I'll share a complex answer to that question or maybe maybe it's not complex i'd encourage you to to not think that way because the more important thing to solve for in the beginning is actually not even the skill. It's the colleague's motivation to learn. Like if I were to solve for one thing on day one, it's the colleague's motivation to learn. Now you can solve for skills second after you've created that. But in the workplace today, not every workplace, but in many, I see the pattern, I'll put my screen back up just to kind of remind you of some of these frames that we shared. In many workplaces, I see the pattern that, that you, you heard about in the beginning of this talk, that the maze is in the mouse, that employees are so locked into their systems of reviews and launches and meetings and memos and blah, 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 that they're not learning. They, the, the desire for personal satisfaction, impact from their work, essentially play and purpose, the system trains them to quell these desires. This is an incredibly articulate way of talking about what we just shared. And the problem I see, the number one problem is actually not choosing the right skill. The number one problem is building motivation to learn. Hmm. And so what I would suggest is, like we shared earlier, if you think about why does the skill check work this way? Like why does it essentially ask you play purpose and potential questions? And then, then help you choose a skill based on the answer to those questions. Because the motivation matters more. And so what I would say is at the very beginning, 
start with the skill that the colleagues want to learn. Now, the system itself ensures that you're learning skills that are pertinent to your job, because at the end of the day, it has to be on the job practice. Like, so for example, if I want to learn eye surgery, I can't because my job never gives me the op the at bats to learn that. But I know it's a, I know it's a controversial take on your question, but I really would encourage you start with the motivation to learn versus the specific skill. And then eventually you can start to get to specific skills once you've kind of gotten there. Yeah, I mean, you build very strongly. Uh, but, uh, of course, that's again part of the, the inherent logic on this total motivation. Now, let's take maybe one other which goes directly to the skills and then we are going to go to compensation goals because I think for everything that we, we now have question. Um, <laughs> So um, another one by Otti is, he asks, is there a formal advancement, for instance, from novice to expert, which is based on feedback of a professional practice um, from other highly skilled pra practitioners? And how does the feedback related to skills development feed into the regular feedback? Yeah. So there's two parts of that question. Like, let me just describe to you what a good version of the skill model looks like. What the good version of the skill model looks like is the colleague is choosing at any given time two skills to work on. Why two? Because it actually, any more than that, the leader gets overwhelmed. And any less than that, it's hard to create opportunity. So we generally recommend two. Colleagues choosing two skills or choosing goals against those skills. They're, at that point, they're, they're creating artifacts of them learning that skill on the job. So you, yes, could you take a training course? Absolutely. You can map each of these skills to training courses and blah, blah, blah. But training courses just expose you to concepts. They're not where you gain fluency. Fluency comes from practice. And so the ask is you actually practice the skills on the job. You, between you and your leader, you're creating opportunities. You're creating a plan of opportunities. In that plan of opportunities, you're now actually practicing on the job. That produces artifacts of learning. Once you and your leader feel like you've actually achieved the, the goal that you set out to learn that skill, you seek endorsement. This goes to Adi's second question. The endorsement mechanism that we recommend, there's, there's many, but what we recommend is actually a panel of the highest skilled contributors looking at your artifacts and endorsing the artifacts. Okay. Why endorse the artifacts? Because we want to take all the bias that we can out of the system. Yeah. And so the panel of experts look at your artifacts and then you achieve endorsement. Um, the, the, so is there formal advancement also out of from, from novice to expert? Well, there's two ways to think about this. One is like within a profession, like I'm a novice accountant to a professional accountant or an expert accountant. One is within a skill. So within a skill, for example, like if you think about the granularity of skill, you think about the granularity of skill here, skills are incredibly granular, like educating adults, objection handling. When the skills are so granular, there's just not a lot of room for difference in expertise. And that's why we generally only map to fluency and mastery. And the only difference between fluency and mastery, because everything needs to be as unbiased as possible, has to be artifact-based, mastery is evidence of transferability. Fluency is not. That's the only difference. Mastery essentially is evidence of transferability. Fluency, you don't need evidence of transferability. You yeah. do that, you get to expertise within a skill. Now, what organizations do is they'll often create paths. Those paths are bundles of skills. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, you can be very creative on how you create those paths. Like, for example, you might not say educating adults is critical for an accountant, but you might say that's critical for a trainer, a consultant, a recruiter and a variety of other roles. Mm -hmm. um, now, the importance of thinking about these skills as more atomic than a role is actually what creates enduring careers. If the skills are truly transferable, mm -hmm. careers are enduring. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the, the, the craft of building a skill map like this is ensuring the highest degree of transferability. So I know that was, that was a lot. No, but that was fascinating. And I think um, I haven't seen Otti asking further towards that. So I think that was also a very instructive answer. 
Um, I think even before we go to goals I have on the list and pay I have on the list, um, maybe let us just once more go back to the overall framework where you distinguish different types of performance. Um, and I had also a question, are you not missing out on something like organizational citizenship behavior or civic behavior? Um, is, 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 is this all in adaptive or how is that composed of? Let's maybe put it this way. Um, well, generally, citizenship is adaptive. So think about citizenship as a concept. Like, think about this, the classic stories of citizenship. You're, you're walking down the sidewalk and there's someone who kind of collapses from a medical issue. Do you help them? Um, or you see a crime and you report it. Like, think about these classic modes of citizenship. Well, those were all adaptive behaviors. The tactical was I was trying to walk down the sidewalk to get to my workplace in time. And so fundamentally, even in companies, citizenship is the solving of problems that weren't part of your day job. And so they tend to manifest as adaptive behaviors. If you are driven by the indirect motives, you won't do those things. So that's kind of one. That's like place number one where that shows up. It does show up as adaptability. You need to have the direct motives to actually express it. You know, put differently, when a person's under pressure, all they solve for is that pressure. Another place where it shows up is, there's actually a few different places where it shows up. One is, in this performance model, compensation is driven by skill. A lot of organizations may make the mistake of trying to drive compensation by goal or process, like these other, these other aspects of performance. The reason why these are not good places to drive compensation is because this is really where you need a lot of citizenship. Like goals often need to be worked as teams. You have to need each other's help. You might even need somebody's help who doesn't have this as a goal. Like I'm working with one tech company right now where they're saying, if if what I need from another colleague isn't in their OKR, they will not help me. So to, to, if you really want that kind of citizenship behavior, you cannot compensate against things that require citizenship behavior. Now, that's why, to, that's why the best access of compensation for a variety of reasons is actually skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I can uh, totally see this. Um, I think the question was also going a little bit towards um, from your own perspective, would I then help or it, or is it then also maybe um, if, it, if it's needing a collective effort, does it also take this um, common attunement into account. Um, and I think that's, um, of course, the whole model you're building is, is building on the individual. So, I mean, how do we have systemic effects in there? Maybe I can ask it this way. Um, there's, two, there's two ways I could have thought about your question. One, if you think about it from a motivation perspective, the indirect motives, particularly emotional and economic pressure, are inherently individual. Like I'm, I'm applying it to a person. Hmm. Play and purpose and potential can be collective. And so one, the direct motives are inherently not individual. They're, they are typically more collective in nature. The indirect motives are actually individual in nature. And so when you are driven by the indirect motives, of course you get less of that kind of that group behavior. The second way I could have described what you're saying is where does collective behavior come from? Um, and think about like stigmergy, the concept of collective behavior in ants, in termites, and in humans. Collective behavior, typically good collective behavior, comes from simple rules applied to the individual. So why do fish swim in schools, for example? Mm -hmm. Simple rules apply to the individual that do, not that do not constrain their adaptability. So if you think like, so take about, think ant, ant, stigm ant stigmergy, like why do they follow pheromone trails? Ant stigmergy is simple rules applied to the individual that actually create emergent collective behavior. I know I'm getting crazy in the weeds of the technicalities here, but essentially what we're describing here is simple rules applied to the individual that don't constrain adaptability that are able to get to that balance of individual and collective behavior that is critical to being that upper right-hand quadrant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also, um, 
Uh, I think the question we could go even deeper into it, but I think we have more questions. So um, uh, from a more practical side again, if we go to the goals, because again, that was a very important part for you, linking also together um, tactical and adaptive performance. Um, I have a very small question. I was just very curious, is there a significant difference between no goal and the performance goals? Because that would be also funny if you could say to all the smart guys, well, listen, there's not even a difference to having no goals. Um, and then, however, there were also um, clearer questions in that sense. So somebody asked, uh, what if, if we would work with a North Star and we would go, give more directions? How would that play out um, in your model? Or why are so, those still better? I can also ask it very easily. Help me at the second question. Do the second question again. I understood the first one about no goals, but do the second one again. The second one was um, asking why do we just not only give directions, for instance, like a North Star, or you kind of say, um, you, you can give your contribution, that's the North Star where we want to march towards. Um, uh, really great questions. So on the first one, on goals, the challenge I think in thinking about, your question was no goal, performance goal, they the same. Mm. In this particular experiment, they were about the same, and actually, even just a little bits and little bits performance goal is less, but probably not significant. Now, the challenge, though, the way you want to think about this, you want to think about it from a first principles basis. Let's say this experiment was conducted in a set of teams where every team member was highly skilled. I would have I would have imagined very little difference between the three, because the highly skilled person would have turned either of these two situations into learning goals for themselves. Like if you think about a really highly skilled professional, they get a target like, hey, we got to increase revenue by 20% and they immediately go into problem solve mode where they do exactly what, what Anna was doing here, where they, in their first step is they break it into pieces. They break it into sub problems, they break into ideas. Highly skilled problem solvers would have performed pretty equally well in all three cases provided there was no additional pressure on the performance goal. If there's pressure on the performance goal, even the highly skilled person would have started to crumble. So the challenge often is, but in most organizations, you don't have that many of those highly skilled folks. And so in the average case, yes, I think you would see what you're seeing, um, where the performance, the learning goal significantly outperforms, the other two are probably at a wash. And in the average goal, the performance goal usually actually does worse because we can't help but create pressure on it. We just can't help it. And so that's that's one. I think your second question was, can we just give a North Star and let people run? Well, it depends on what we mean by that. It also depends on your strategy. So for example, if giving a North Star and let people run feels like this, like the coach that just says, hey, we're just gonna do your job, get 103 points, and team, you figure it out. Well, the problem is in a lot of organizations, the figuring it out was the hard part. Hmm. And when executives, senior leaders who are the most skilled in that organization, essentially say, well, my job is to come up with 103, your job is to figure it out. The 103 was not the hard part. Like the financial analyst that covers your company could tell you that number. The figure it out was the hard part. And I think a lot of organizations, especially as the bar for performance just increased, 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 we've, it's gotten hard to figure it out. And so one, de so it depends on what you mean by the North Star. If the North Star is just that number, well, you know, you have a problem. If the North Star is, I figured every single problem out and now I'm just giving you tasks, well, that's a problem too, because you're, you're likely behaving more like this. What I find to be more a more honest way of thinking about this is leaders at the top need to understand if the problem that each of these boats has to solve can be solved by that boat. If it can't be solved by that boat, then they have to help. Yeah. And so what we generally find is a learning oriented, problem solving oriented operating model where the right problems are surfaced to the right altitudes, which is really what this kind of ecosystem of of capabilities is about creating 
essentially surfacing the right problems at the right altitudes to solve them. That's so, why you got to think a little bit more nuanced about just setting a North Star. Yeah, so it, it, fo it forces you to really think um, also in a systematic way um, how you construct a system. I think that's an additional point. And the other point, which was also written somewhere in the talk, um, what we also know is that making progress is very motivating, which is probably, I'm not so sure whether it's part of your potential, but of course that's all about learning and making progress. I have to see towards what I'm making progress. So it's not so much necessarily the goal attainment, but this progress making. And I think you have captured that sure. um, with your system. When think about progress. Progress would likely positively influence at least five of these motives. Yeah. So for example, let's say you're playing a game it's hard, it, you start to get bored if you're not making progress because progress usually leads to novelty. Mm -hmm. Purpose, you can't feel like your work matters if you're not feeling progress. Potential, progress helps you get to that eventual it matters. Emotional pressure, well, when you're making progress, you're less likely to be judged and blamed by your company. Mm -hmm. And progress in many ways is, is not inertia. So progress is a, is a concept that cuts across many of these motives, as do many concepts, by the way. Like when you think about a lot of these concepts that you see people talk about with their relation to, to motivation, they usually are shorthand for things that might affect uh, constellations of these motives. Yeah. So I was just very quickly, you know, I like that. And, and it's uh, very important for us to think that also through through this uh, model. Uh, Otti, can I take one last question? And I think, um, just because Joris was trying it several times, he now has the question, um, how do you see the role of coaching in your model? Well, um, critical. Like when you think about these critical, but let's kind of get into the weeds of it for a moment. If you think about these as the drivers of performance, like maybe my restaurant needs better skill because we're not adapting to issues, or maybe our processes are off and our kitchen's backlogged, or maybe we don't have the right goals as we kind of try to expand from one to like five restaurants or maybe each restaurant isn't experimenting to the local market, or maybe the, the teams of these restaurants are demotivated. Like if you think about all these factors of performance, many of them are actually quite difficult. And if you think about the typical organization, especially these days, and especially fast growth organizations, people, as soon as they're good at their job, they go to the next one. This is the Peter principle. And so what you find is like everyone is not good at their job because by the time they are, they get promoted to the next. And so often we find that teams are presented with problems in any of these dimensions that they cannot solve. And so coaching is really quite critical. Like a good coach is able to jump into a team and really quickly say, okay, I see the issue. You have a skill gap here. Oh, I totally see the issue. There's a motivation problem here. Oh, I totally see this issue. I don't think you have the right goals. Mm -hmm. And so coaching is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. But when you think about coaching, think about the coach of a sports team. That sports team coach is there watching the gameplay. They're, they're seeing the, the players on the field. They're seeing the training on the field. That coach isn't distant from that visibility. In knowledge work today, most coaches are not visible. They can't see the gameplay. Mm -hmm. And so how can they coach? And then they coach from a distance. Like, oh, we have a QBR. And in that QBR, you write a long memo. And that long memo, you're describing your gameplay. And I'm going to coach you off that memo. That's ridiculous. Like, imagine if like a sports team did this. Like every quarter, I'm going to write a memo about my gameplay, and then I'm going to put it in front of my coach, and then you're going to coach me on that memo. Coaching. One of the biggest problems we've seen in coaching is these five elements are invisible to them. They cannot see them. They cannot see them. They cannot coach. And so a big part of our model is about making these five pieces radically transparent. Mm -hmm. Not, not because radical transparency is a virtue that I'm trying to shoot for. It's because it is a necessity to good coaching. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And one thing um, that, that comes to my mind here, connecting it to some of the other conversations we've had also with Michele Zanini. If I, if I take this picture, Neil, and I apply the staple um, framework to explore individual performance, the AMO model, right? Then we, we have the ability, which is your skill. We got the motivation. 
And somehow the opportunity area spans across the process and the goals, which arguably is in the role space and the degree of experimentation relates to the kind of freedom that is in the job design. But I think it opens up a, a wider parenthesis in terms of keeping the, the organizational evolution, the organizational design, including the roles, including the process, including the structures, including the remits of the different units and how the teams interact, keeping that dynamic as well and somehow linking the individual development and progress that you and Anton had talked about with an organizational evolution, which I think also to your earlier point, you need to somehow allocate the problems to the bolts at the right level that might also dynamically change. So you might need to create new bolts. You might need to kind of uh, agree with together with the bolts how to change the configuration. So you almost need like marketplaces where they meet and then collectively kind of reallocate some of those problems. And I think that would be very fascinating to to connect to some of the experiences we've had in terms of um, Obeya rooms and, um, and and agile management as well. So you get really to performance management, not only looking at individuals, but organizational evolution. And um, yeah. I think um, with that, we are probably out of time. I know you have a very, very um, tough schedule, um, Neil. So can I ask you maybe for the listeners that, and the many watchers, which I'm sure will, will see this video, um, similar to the question that we got earlier, what is your recommendation and call to action for our friends in HR who might find yeah, themselves in some of the type of organizations that you have encountered where they're, they're very far away from this type of model. How could they make this real? What is the first step from your perspective? Yeah, 100%. There's a, there's a variety of first steps, but the, the first baby steps are usually about learning. So for example, right, generally recommend is a few things. One, I, a lot of companies have actually managed to go quite far by just reading Prime to Perform because it starts to build a common language, common framework, get everyone to start to see there's a way to think about this. Um, we also recommend teaching them, like do talks, bake it into leadership training. Um, there's been a number of organizations where that's been their starting point. Um, we're happy to jump in and do like a kickoff talk with some of your executives, your company. Generally, when we start a transformation, we start by teaching. So that's one. Um, two, what we also find is start by just getting teams to practice. You can use the tools that we talked about today. Uh, particularly the ones that are about the quarterly rhythms, the AI, the prioritization, the problem solving, that's super easy. Lastly, reach out to me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to field them. Like, drop me a line. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. And the the short answer, though, is I would start by teaching. Like, build a common language, a common knowledge base, help people see the performance orientation, help them see the business case, help them see, as Antoinette said earlier, this is actually not about unbundling it's actually about ecosystem and when it's about ecosystem it's actually fewer levers at lower cost that are more effective you get that part right then what i've really found is an executive that the only times i've found executives who are at that point like i don't want to be this is usually ones that are one foot out the door you might have that in which case that's tough excellent thank you very much neil and so call to action um, get to the common language, get some of the learning and the teaching, call out to Neil to get further information. Um, thank you very much. I think it's given us a lot to think about. And uh, Neil, if we can send you the questions that Antona didn't mention, uh, didn't manage to mention because there were so many, in case you ever have a time to look at it, we will feature all the answers on the website. And with that, also big thanks to Antona, who has again led us through an exciting Q&A here. And um, thanks, everybody, for being here. Neil, all the best. Back to New York. And um, I hope we're going we're gonna to continue this journey together on trying to make performance management a little bit better because it's about time. And with that, Neil, awesome. thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Speak to you all soon. Take Thank care. you all.